Up next, we have Changing the World One Trip at a Time, How Local Sustainable Tourism Saves Wildlife and Protects Habitat Belonging to the World. Jeffrey Kent is CEO of Abercrombie, Abercrombie & Kent Group. He works with the world's most exclusive luxury adventure travel experiences. And as the chair of the World Travel and Tourism Council, he led integration of sustainable tourism practices. He currently serves on the leadership council of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you. Looks like I'll come here, I think. Um, it's very nice to be uh, with you all, and I've certainly learned a great thing from uh, Sally and Chip the last two days. I've traveled to probably over 130 countries, and I've been to the North Pole and the South Pole, Antarctic, and everywhere, and everywhere in between. I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about sustainability, mainly in Africa today. Does this work? Uh-oh. Very good. I was, um, I was born in Africa. I grew up there as a young child, up in the forest, and uh, uh, grew up with the Kikuyu tribe in the Mount Kinnikop area. Grew up with buffaloes, lions, elephants. So my whole childhood was really steeped uh, working with communities, working with wildlife, and working with habitat. And I think it was sort of got very deeply ingrained into my DNA. I founded uh, Abercrombie and Kent with my parents um, in 1962. Uh, we made up the name uh, Abercrombie and Kent. Uh, Abercrombie and Kent sounded very posh and very grand. There's no Abercrombie. A, B, put us top of, the, top of the alphabet. Sounded great to have a partner like that. And uh, even to this day, I get uh, messages all my people do that, um, oh, please tell everybody we're great friends of the Abercrombies. Kent's don't really matter here. Today, the company, I started with one Land Rover, a dream out of Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. And today, we have a company, about 52 companies worldwide, with about 2,500 staff operating in almost any country. And we really like people to go and have great experiences with the utmost comfort and the utmost safety. One of the Maasai tribe I grew up with. And of course, you can't put all this together to have sustainable tourism without wealthy clients. And the first person, the first people I came to, I read in Time magazine in an Nairobi coffee house, this is in the 60s, that the richest people in the world were Texans. They had big hats and big boots. And so I came and I used to look for Texans wherever I went and managed to get a few Texans on safari with me. And they were wonderful and they spread the word until this day. So I really thank, I thank the state of Texas. Um, we've, we've heard a lot in this, in this talk, in this uh, meeting. But what I want to deal with is sustainability. Our whole organization revolves around that. My, my take on sustainability is that you have to protect the wildlife. You have to protect their habitat. You have to protect the community, give them jobs. And you have to give them, uh, protect the community, and you have to create uh, an economy around them. You have to build hospitals. You have to build schools. And you have to build a marketplace for their handicrafts and other commodities they may come up with. So they, be they become sustainable, not us become sustainable. That's point one. And you must put yourself in their shoes at all times. Mine, mine is very pragmatic, actually. I just like, you know, get, make sure everyone's happy. And then, as uh, I led uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council, founder member, I led it as chairman for six years, spent my whole life visiting presidents of countries, including the president of this country, explaining to them the importance of travel and tourism as an industry. We represent 8.2% of all employment in the world. We represent 235 million jobs are created through travel and tourism. We also represent 8.9% of the world's GDP. So travel and tourism is one of the most important sectors um, that, uh, that uh, presidents should be dealing with. And it creates cheap employment. You don't have to build huge manufacturing. You don't have to export. You don't have to do all that. It's an export business using the beauty of your own country and the, and the people, and your own peoples of that country. Uh, in Africa, uh, we're having a, a big problem at this minute with uh, poaching. I'm sure you've been reading about it. And the poaching has now become second to drugs 
in the, in the illegal smuggling. Uh, elephants, we're losing 49,000 elephants a year. Uh, one a day in Kenya being killed at this moment as we speak. And it is really, it has become, and I've, you know, you heard, I was born in Africa, it's becoming catastrophic. This is really, really serious and bad. And then we have rhinos. We've already lost in Kenya this year 25 rhinos. And at this rate, the rate they're being taken out, they will be extinct within seven to ten years of now. It's really, when I, when I grew up in, in Zambia, we had like 10,000 rhinos in the Zambian Valley. Today, there are none. They're extinct. Most places, they're extinct. You just don't see them anymore. So this is a huge problem, and a lot of us are gathering together to try and fight this problem. Uh, Richard Leakey, I'm sure many of you have heard of Dr. Richard Leakey. He and I grew up together from the age of six. He headed up the uh, Kenya Wildlife Services, did a fantastic job. Uh, they then sabotaged his plane, and he had a crash, and he lost both his legs. And here's Richard over here, still doesn't care, walking with two, two legs there. And we're up at uh, visiting his place at Lake Turkana just two months ago. So we're getting Richard involved. And going back to Kenya, I've been, as a child, and the whole family have been involved in the Maasai Mara. And there's another family called the Craig family who've been highly involved in, in Lewa, up in, up, up in the north. And I'm coming to that in a minute. Uh, Prince Charles and I are good friends. I got to know him very well because in my other life, I was a, I was a champion polo player. That's all I really like to do. And I won the U.S. Open twice, but I got to know Prince Charles very well. And he is somebody who wakes up every day worrying about this planet. He probably knows more about this planet than most people in this room. I've got 10 minutes. I better move on. Um, Riders, this is Lewa Downs. And Ian Craig. Ian Craig is, is from there, and he's put together this organization called Stop Ivory. Um, he's formed a great area with the gravy zebra uh, living up in the north, and he again has brought all the pastoralists together. He creates tourism through lodges. He's trained the Maasai and the Samburu to actually become game rangers. Going to the Maasai Mara, that's my sister Anne, and Taylor, if you don't know, she gives her whole life to animals. Uh, here she is with snares, spends her whole life trying to protect elephants. And um, we also have done a big organization, the Maasai Mara, uh, called Friends of Conservation, started in 1982. And when the rhinos were down to seven, we spent well over a million dollars and brought them from seven to 43. And today we built schools, hospitals, everything else. I want to move straight along. Uh, Botswana, this is Sereti Kama. Um, went with his helicopter, we built lodges, 12 lodges throughout Botswana with the concept you work with the state, you work with the private industry, myself, and you work with the councils. Everything is very, very um, sustainable. These are the lodges we build. We actually uh, build them out of uh, 130,000 annual million cans we pick up. We build them out of Mapani poles, uh, cement, everything. These are the people we train locally. So everything is done around the communities. But what I want to do is get on to the gorillas. This is my most important thing, all right? And probably the best thing I've ever done in my life. Years ago, I grew up with gorillas as a child, myself and Alan Root, long before Diane Fossey ever found a gorilla, incidentally. Alan Root and myself were fooling around, and I was in Kezi Bueg, and he was elsewhere. And so I always knew where the gorillas lived. And in Uganda, President Museveni was going to come to power, all right? And um, I knew the gorillas lived in this area called Bwindi, which is just next door. And um, gorillas, they weigh 485 pounds. The females are half the size. They're probably one of the nearest to us in our DNA, after bonobos. And they're fascinating and wonderful, wonderful creatures. So I saw President Museveni. I said, listen, when you come to power, I want you to do me a favor. We will take the impenetrable forest of Windy and we'll make it into a national park. I will build a lodge there and I'll bring wealthy tourists there. I will pay for the habituation of the early gorillas because none of them were habituated. Um, we did all that. I'm going to speed it up. I know. So we did all that. We, and he, he formed a national park. I built a park. I built a lodge. We, we habituated the gorillas. And then this is me just about three months ago with a male gorilla in Bwindi. You can now see them within one to three hours. You spend about an hour with them. And anybody who hasn't done it, you should do it. Let's talk about the economics of this. We now 
we, Abercrombie and Kent alone brings $1 million of tourist money direct to the community. They charge $650 a license. So this is bringing in with all, we've now habituated seven troops. And so they're getting about $7 million into this area in cash terms, going to the community, not to the government. Let's move along. We built, these are the tourists who come in. We also, so we've now habituated or have in the area 340 gorillas. There are only 800 gorillas left in the world today. So just from my idea, I've got five minutes, I have saved half the gorillas left in the world through that one idea. And but do you remember I was saying earlier on all about the community, right? So we moved the Batwa pygmies out. They had AIDS. They had no, so we started a little hospital. One doctor would come in once a week beside a fig tree. This was it. That has now moved on. We've donated well over a million dollars, myself and my clients, to this hospital. We have maternity wards. We have operating theaters, neonatal clinics. We have nursing schools. We, we now take care of 60,000 outpatients a year in this one hospital, which is incredible. And, and we've brought infant, infant mortality. We've cut infant mortality by 50%. So this... So this is the idea I want to take on to other animals being threatened in the world to create this whole sustainability of the community, of the area, just like this. And then I go all the way through. Wonderful pictures. Don't have time to show them all. <laughs> Beautiful. You've got to come on a safari, all right? You really <laughs> come and change your lives, okay? And biogas. Uh, this is my gorilla camp, wetlands. Everything in a thoroughly sustainable. Chief's camp, the most fine, fine place. I took uh, Ted there many years ago, beautiful uh, handicrafts, which we teach everybody, my wildebeest migration, 1.5 million animals, uh, kudu, uh, uh, well, and finally Bill and Melinda Gates. I took Bill Gates on his first uh, safari ever, and as a result of that visit to Africa, you know, he's supported it through the $30 billion raised and has done wonderful things, as has Ted Turner and many other wonderful people who've come to Africa fallen in love with Africa, and like me, have become passionate about it and trying to do something about it. So I want to thank you, Ted. Thank Bill Gates. Thank Melinda. They do a fantastic job. And um, that's it. Come to Africa. <laughs>